Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's Kingsley Dixon here, John Curtin Distinguished Professor at Curtin University. I was raised in a beekeeping family and I've been 30 years a beekeeper and today I'm talking about an issue that I think is of concern both to me as a professional ecologist and biologist and who has lived and worked in this state my entire career, born in the bush, but also an issue that I think is fundamental to the future of what I would hope is the future of a very vibrant honey industry in Western Australia. And the subtext to all of this is what matters to beekeepers matters for the biodiversity, the ecosystems and the ecologies of Western Australia. The Im images that you see here, the top one is from 1802, shows uh, some smoke in the distance. This is from the Nicholas Badan expedition going up the east coast near Bruny Island. And these were in fact smoke signals from the indigenous people alerting all other groups to the fact that there is a significant new imposter on their coast. The bottom image, which is from the Ensign Dale panels from 1834, in the distance you may just be able to make out some smoke. And from the Noongar people in that region, this was their nuanced rather than their uh, ubiquitous burning of the landscape where they were selectively um, burning areas around campsites and along uh, particular walkways. So these images show there was the evidence of fire uh, at the pre-European and European time, but certainly not the fire that we see today. Why is this important? Well, Australia has a very sad record for significant impacts across the landscape. We are the fourth country for extinctions of plants and animals. For example, we have 1,300 plant species that are federally listed, about 60 odd species that are now extinct. Now there are 1200 plant species in the entire UK. So it shows that our extinction rates exceed the floras of certain countries. Importantly, there's a reason why this is so. As I'm sure many of you would be aware, the systems, the ecosystems, the ecologies and the species we have here are found here and nowhere else. And these are the sorts of numbers that we have. 85% of the flowering plants are unique. And if we look at the southwest corner of Western Australia, of course, those uniqueness values climb. Now, this is a Landsat image. It's a really critical image for us to dwell on, look at, absorb, and understand what this, this image actually means. You'll see along the southeastern part, the Vermin Barrier Fence. This demarcated the line, roughly, of agricultural clearing. We see the Swan Coastal Plain down this side, and then we see the very few remnants. We are a biodiversity hotspot, one of uh, 38 in the world, and we're a hotspot because we've cleared all but 30% of the landscape. And much of the remnant and dissected vegetation that we have is, of course, the forests and the woodlands of the southwest corner. And critically important they are for our industry and for the protection of so many animals and plants that are our unique identity and provide such important ecological services to our landscapes, which includes, of course, important water catchment um, for some of our dam systems. But with such a dissected landscape, we are now imposing a broad acre system of imposed European style firing. This is not based on indigenous burning patterns. This is a typical day. This is from uh, the 2nd of May. It shows a typical burning throughout the southwest corner. You can see nature reserves in the north. You can see the major area down um, near the Scott River Plains in the south. And throughout the system, as we smell and see the smoke permeating Perth, we now know that prescribed burning is, with if we have no change, a permanent part of our autumn, winter and spring environments in the southwest. This is critical for the southwest of Western Australia, probably more than anywhere else. We are more diverse than 98% of the diversity in other countries. For example, we only have one Jarrah forest in the world. That's our Jarrah forest. And Jarrah is unique and endemic to the southwest. If we look at this area at Mount Lucerne National Park, now subject to rotational prescribed burning, and we throw out a 10 by 10 metre square in that area, we will get an astonishing 110 flowering plant species. There's virtually nowhere else on earth, including the Amazonian rainforest, that can exceed those sorts of levels. 
What does prescribed burning mean for this? It means that the fire frequencies will increase in these areas. It means potentially up to a quarter of the fire sensitive species, many of those critical to beekeeping and critical to support the ecologies of these areas will be permanently lost or forever altered. So what is the current regime that we face with prescribed burning and why are these impacts now potentially greater than they have ever been in the history of the way Europeans have managed these landscapes? Well, it's certainly on an unprecedented scale, frequency, and without any change, this is a permanent feature of these landscapes. All the images you see here are prescribed burning that has been occurring in the southwest corner. The current program of target-driven system means that around 12,000 square kilometres will be burnt each six years. Importantly, around major centres, burning will be done on three-year rotations. None of this, of course, is supplemented by important things such as weed management, which, as we now know from experiences working in urban reserves, mean that the weed load and hence flammability of systems will greatly increase. Age since burn drives where areas will be burnt, and it's not negotiable. They will be burnt on six-year or less rotations. Anything greater than six years will be considered a threat. Importantly, the target excludes any wildfire and prescribed burning escapes. Critically, whereas in previous iterations of prescribed burning, fuel loads drove the system, it is now independent of fuel loads. So now we see ankle high heathlands in Bremer and Fitzgerald National Park, Stirling Range, the Mount Basur area, now being subjected to these high intensity frequencies. What's important is that the designers of prescribed burning never designed the system to actually control a large wildfire. So we will still have wildfires, we'll still have canopy fires, particularly in our forest and woodland systems, irregardless of whether they've been prescribed burnt or not. The system does not ensure that. It provides a level of protection around strategic assets and that's where we see a future for prescribed burning, but not on the broad acre that we see today. Now, in creating what we now consider the new normal in Australia, we can look back into the recent history to see that indeed there is a certainly an important and fundamental aspect to um, uh, this system that will be critical um, to understanding the future of how we manage the landscapes. If we look at this uh, 1939 Royal Commission report, uh, done in response to the devastating 1939 fires that were in that area. Um, the scrub grew and flourished, flour was used to clear the system and importantly across these landscapes because of the burning the whole system became more flammable and this was clearly seen by many of those in those forest departments and they looked and were keen to get chained but the burning continued, the flammability increased. What has this meant for the southwest of Western Australia? Well, we know the consequences because we have a big experiment right on our door. It's King's Park. We're very lucky from 1939 to have had a detailed uh, and comprehensive mapping of the southwest corner of Western Australia, of, sorry, of King's Park. And uh, this was work done by Alison Baird, the first female botanist, uh, in the University of Western Australia, where she mapped all the significant trees in a large area. We found those maps and those transects and we were able to redo them 60 years later in 1999. We published a paper in 2008 which summarised the results. What we were able to show is the tree canopy number or the number of trees actually increased. But while, when we dissected the data, what we did find were that worryingly, bank shares had declined from 55% of the area to 22%. Banksia lucifolia had reduced to just one tree cluster. Banksia grandis was 10%. Banksia menziesii rapidly declining as was Banksia attenuata. What we were seeing in these systems were from 1944 to 1962, three year rotational burns. Then in 1950, they burnt one quarter of the park on an annual cycle, however, Wildfires still kept occurring in the system 
No burning was implemented from 1963 to 73. Strip burning and asset targeted burning happened from 1974 to 1994. So there was a whole range of imposed fire regimes in this system with the consequences being significant and important tree species had declined. What we also found in the research that we've subsequently done in Kings Park bushland is that there's a whole range of species that have significantly been missing and that the replacement of species in some of these systems were by species that were just rapid regrowers, she oaks, rapid regrowth wattles, chewets were increasing in certain areas. Importantly for beekeepers, whole swags of fire sensitive understory, those species that don't resprout, that come back from uh, seed buried in the soil seed bank, had vanished from the bushland. Of course, the wattles and some of the legumes increased in great numbers. So things such as native heaths and baronias, things that we rely on as beekeepers, have gone from King's Park and they're gone for good. How do we know that? Well, we've been looking at an area out in the wheat belt of Western Australia. It was an area called Hartley's Reserve. If you look into that little blue area that you can see circumscribed um, in the map, this was an area that was cleared before World War II, was never cropped. The farmer who did it went off to war. The area stayed embedded in natural woodland. And we've been able to go back there consistently. And today, this is what we see. We do not get migration of ecologies. We do not get migration of species back into these denatured areas. The chances that Kings Park will ever regain any of their species is unlikely because we have systems of no migration. Importantly, a key issue that we've now got for our 120 million years of evolutionary history that we have encapsulated in the Southwest is that species either now have to adapt to six year or less rotational burning or go extinct. Here are some examples of species that we know will vanish from ecosystems. This is all published scientific work. These banks here need recovery periods greatly in excess of the three to six year rotational burns now being pr pr proposed. Native heaths, 15 years. Eucalyptus salubris woodland has ages from recent work published uh, by the Gosper group out of CSIRO shows greater than 200 years um, were the fire-free intervals for those woodland systems. Jarrah Forest from the review published by Bradshaw et al. in 2018 shows an 81-year period for recovery of those bushlands. Losing the plants is one thing, but we will also lose many significant animals, be they honey possums with a 25.6-year recovery period or the 20 to 25-year fire-free interval to sustain populations in Bankshire woodlands on the Swan Coastal Plain. The Mardu, uh, the yellow-footed antichinus, requires more than 40-year unburnt Jarrah forest to survive. The Forest Department researchers, uh, Piers Christensen and Kimber in 1975, showed that this animal was now rare in regularly prescribed burnt areas. Importantly, whether you're a reptile, or a bird, you will be impacted when fire frequencies exceed the post-fire recovery period. For Kings Park, the work done by Harry Recker and this group showed that the extinction of the splendid wren in Kings Park in the 1960s was directly related to the imp imposition of prescribed burning across those landscapes. So the impacts will be large, they will be permanent, and they will have long-term consequences for ecological viability, importantly, the future of any beekeeping and honey industry. Importantly, altered systems matter. If it affects you as beekeepers from a natural system, then it matters to wildlife. So we're looking at a wholesale impact across industry through to wildlife protection. I also see that WA has an enormous opportunity to produce manuka style honeys. We already know that Jarrah honeys command a premium. We can't produce sufficient. And unique varietals could generate, I believe, an industry well in excess of $300 million per annum. We know this is possible because in 2016, the New Zealand honey industry was worth just $35 million. It's now worth in excess of $335 million 
through the benefits of Manuka. What if we do change prescribed burning practices? What are the likely risks? Well, the science is clear that there is no clear scientific agreement concerning the protective or ecological benefits of targeting larger areas by fuel reduction programs. Importantly, it's a poor return on investment. Prescribed burning currently, the 2019 budget is $35 million, provides a very poor return on investment where we'd have to look at something like four times the area to be burnt to protect an equivalent area uh, of forest of, uh, in, in the region. Importantly, the Kings Park experiment showed that despite all of those burning regimes, a major wildfire occurred every 10 to 15 years. This is a risk the community needs to consider. It needs to be understood and that importantly in going forward, we may need to think of a new way of tackling what we perceive as a major risk. I propose that alternatives such as fast detection and rapid suppression are a more worthy way of looking at investment, being strategic rather than broad scale target driven. Take for example, this, this is the JAXA, the JAXA Himawari monitor satellite. And thanks to Tristan Campbell for providing this image. This is again from the 2nd of uh, May, and it shows uh, in the Southwest, all the little red dots, lots of stuff out in the paddocks where the paddock burning's happening before sowing. But you can see three major fires and the plumes going out over the West Coast uh, from prescribed burning. One down near the Scott Plains, uh, one near Busselton, and one um, uh, in the dwelling up area. We can detect, we can detect in real time and we can use this to improve suppression and detection capabilities. I'll conclude by saying our industry and importantly the failure